Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this special event. I find it a very important event to have in June, uh, commemoration perspectives from the Caribbean islands. Uh, this event is organized in the run-up to uh, 1st of July, uh, Ketikoti, when the abolition of Dutch slavery is uh, celebrated, or at least commemorated. Um, we can have a discussion about whether it was 1863 or 1873, but that's for uh, another day. Uh, today is focused on Caribbean perspectives. This month is going to see two other uh, events too. Uh, on the 23rd, there is going to be an event on uh, uh, having the 1st of July turned into a national holiday with Zwart Manifest. And on the 30th of this month, Professor Rosemary Allen is going to do the Katikoti Lecture. Uh, she's from Curacao, so we will have another uh, perspective from the Caribbean, which I highly celebrate. So today's event is uh, organized by Be Right Back by Bing, uh, Pakhuis de Zwijger, and Ninsey. And the goal is to discuss slavery and the abolition uh, from these different perspectives so that we can have a more diverse and inclusive conversation about this. Uh, we are going to have uh, four speakers, which I will introduce in a bit, uh, who all represent a perspective from the Caribbean, not the perspective, at, uh, of course, uh, and the goal is to open up that conversation. Uh, so I'm happy to uh, be moderating this event. My name is Lisa Delgado. Uh, I have an expertise in human rights education uh, related to racism. Uh, and through my work, I focus, of course, on uh, narratives and uh, uh, diversity and inclusions in those and inclusion in those narratives. Uh, what I can say about my own relation to the Caribbean is that I lived in Curacao for several years, uh, and as a lawyer there, it was uh, the first time that I learned about the power imbalances uh, within the Kingdom of the uh, of the Netherlands and uh, also the complicated relations, I could say, uh, uh, between uh, the islands on the one hand and the Netherlands on the other hand when we look at politics and, and law. Um, so maybe that's something we'll touch upon as well, uh, the not being aware of those relations here in the Netherlands. What we're going to do today, we're going to have a panel discussion first with our four uh, speakers. After that, we'll have a short period of time for questions and answers uh, from uh, you, uh, questions from the audience. And after that, we'll have three round tables where uh, different themes will be discussed. And those round tables will be led by our speakers. The panel discussions are uh, Discussions are going to be around four themes. Uh, the first one is the impact and meaning of the history uh, of slavery and abolition on the islands, the ways in which slavery and abolition are remembered and commemorated, reparations, restoring and maybe also healing is also a theme, and then also how slavery and colonialism shaped the relation between the islands and the Netherlands. For grand themes, um, we don't have weeks and weeks to talk about those, so we're going to touch upon them, I think, at least uh, with uh, Guillaume Goedhoop. She, she's an historian, uh, a past guest maker of uh, Be Right Back by Bing. Kjeld Kroon, uh, he's spe specialized in decolonial and political philosophy and active for political rights for Bonaire. Chantal Jesseroon, sociologist and invested in emphasizing and uh, representing Caribbean cultural identity. And then Ruben Severina, uh, board member of NINSE and also chairman of the supervisory board of OCAN, an organization, um, uh, Overleg or Orgaan Caribisch Nederland. So let's start. Historical impacts of slavery and um, the abolition on the islands. Kionem, what can you tell us about that? Let me start with you first. There are many things to say, but if I think back, even though I was in that sense when I was doing my um, 
my schooling at the Erasmus, I, I, I was taught to dig into archives and make standardized lists and you know, finding all of that information. But I would like to also depart from um, my point of view of being raised in Aruba and being born in Aruba and how actually there was a lack, a total lack of commemorating the Emancipation Day. Um, I know that it's a fact that that day was uh, so historically important because of my Surinamese background. Um, we're Kitty Koti, where most people who live in the Netherlands have heard of or celebrate on the 1st of July, but it was on the island itself very much a Surinamese thing as well, which is something interesting. Um, so the short answer for, from departing from the point of view of being raised and born in Aruba, it has not been and it's still not a widespread collective memory um, on the island at all, actually. So you would say that a Surinamese community on Aruba, at yes. least, is, is the community that commemorates yes. the abolition of slavery yes. and also slavery itself? remembers it at least yes. actively. The collective memory in Aruba is not linked, uh, in my opinion, and in like the, the festivities throughout the year on mm -hmm. the islands that are linked to commemorating that part of the history of the island. Um, and I think it's because um, in comparison, because history is often com in comparison in how we learn it, uh, in school books, is that Aruba was also called the Isla Inutil by uh, Dutch settlers, colonial settlers, and it was kind of more of an island where food was produced for the other islands um, and wasn't that important. So the the aanwezigheid, how do you say that? The presence. The presence of black enslaved people was way smaller throughout all of those years. Mm -hmm. um, so their labor was not linked to the building of Aruba in that sense. Not in colonial archives, but not in the current collective memory, if I could state it like that. Okay, so the historical picture still has an effect on the commemoration and remembrance today. So before we dive deeper into the historical impacts, then maybe uh, I'll turn to Ruben. Ruben, uh, I think you might be able to tell us more about the Surinamese uh, community in Curaçao, I think, and then uh, related to celebrating the 1st of July, if I'm not wrong. Also, uh, before we continue, uh, the audience, let's make it clear that we're uh, using different languages today. So I'm speaking in English. The main language today is going to be English, but we can react in Dutch, uh, or you can ask questions later also in Papiamento. Riven? Um, no. No. <laughs> I cannot tell you much about the Suriname, Surin Surinamese community in uh, Curaçao. Uh, what I can say is that I believe that the situation in Curaçao is no different than that in Aruba. Mm. Uh, uh, yesterday, I, I've been browsing through old, old uh, papers. I found a paper of 1946 in which a um, writer uh, was talking about um, uh, commemorating, office, officializing um, July 1st and May 4th. Mm -hmm. And the writer said, May 4th, I understand. July 1st, I do not understand because of, on Curaçao it doesn't live. Mm. 46. And I found different uh, other articles from different years uh, prior to, to 46 in which uh, clearly states that July 1st didn't, doesn't live, has, has no meaning at all on Curaçao. And for our understanding, May 4th, why did the writer understand May 4th? After the Second World War. Ah, okay. Yes, okay. Much colored, yeah. Okay, much yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I understand. So. Okay, I, I thought that maybe 17th of August was going to be uh, something that the writer would write about, but we'll come to that later, maybe. Um, if I react to that, actually, of course. It's pretty funny, but when I went to school in Curaçao, that's where I learned about slavery. That's where I learned to be proud of who I am. Whereas when I moved to St. Martin, there, I never heard anything. Yes, so, slavery. No, but also the commemoration of it and mm -hmm. how important it was. We would always, 
on July 1st, we would always dress up and we would always have that specific moment that we would just commemorate where we come from, where we are now, whereas in St. Martin, that is unheard of. So that is a very interesting comparison, I think, between the islands, and I find it funny that you say that it isn't. Chantal, and you say you moved to Curaçao. Where did you move from? I moved from Curaçao to St. Martin. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I understood yeah. uh, wrongly. Yeah. Okay, and what does that mean for you then, that in Curaçao people actually stand still by, um, or uh, pay attention to the date? Yeah, it influenced my national pride. Mm -hmm. it, it influenced the way I see myself in a, in a, in a context of Europeans. It, it influenced mm -hmm. who I am. It influenced my identity. It influenced um, the way I speak about my past and my history. And if I see how it is in St. Martin, there's this culture that Let's just forget the past. Let's just move on. It's not mm -hmm. that important. Okay. And, and yeah. was that related to July 1st, this in Curacao that you described, or not necessarily? From what I can remember, yes, because yeah. I was pretty young. Okay. But I always remember July 1st mm -hmm. is the day we commemorate being freed from slavery. Yeah. Okay. Well, you wait, to yes, forget. because um, uh, I live by now, 30, 33 years in Holland, okay, things would have changed. Can be, because I've been teaching history too in, uh, in the MAVO on Curaçao. So I know for, one, for a fact that we did a talk about July, July 1st. What we talked about was August 17th, Tula. And what we see, there's in all the, the brief moments there were commemoration of July 1st on Curaçao, it was always connected to Tula. Thus, in one way or other, mo a moment or not, Tula would be present in the whole commemoration. Uh, if you see, uh, for instance, on July 1st, 1963, they, they, the, 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 uh, Dr. Ragosa Gomez was a commissioner then. He um, made the... Um, the the stump the statue? Yeah, the stump. not the statue, but the, 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 the um, uh, what did the stump be top set? Oh. Sockle. Mm -hmm. uh, the sockle has been empty for a lot of time. The, the idea was on July 1st, 1963, there would be a statue on, of Tula on that sockle. <laughs> but nobody knows how Tula looked like, so there's still no, no, uh, no statue of Tula. Yeah. But July 1st, in the time I was on Curaçao, uh, August 17th, Tula, for sure, till the day of today, we commemorate Tula. Yeah. Kjell, what is your reaction to this, the commemoration um, on 1st of July? I, uh, from what I remember and what I've experienced on Bonaire, um, we, we don't pay as much of attention around the Emancipation Day either. We do have our like cultural traditions and such, like Simadan and all, which does show a linkage to maybe our closer grandparents and their way of life and how they harvest it and everything. But we don't pay a lot of attention to the actual past of slavery um, during those days. It's often just focusing on the more tangible cultural things, on the food, on the clothing and things like that. But there, there, there is not a lot of space to really talk about the, the past of slavery. Okay, uh, and 1st of July is also then not something that not, lives uh, in on, no, on Bonaire at least. I don't, no. no. Uh, but then when I saw Ruben say Tula, I think the three of you went like this. So Tula is, is a name that you know. Uh, I think Tula has become a symbol. Uh, uh, maybe you can explain what's Tula means to you. Um, let me start with Chantel first, since you said that on Curacao you actually do pay attention to slavery and the abolition. Yeah, what does Tula mean to me? It 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 shows bravery. That that's what Tula means to me, and it mm -hmm. it it gives me that sense of hope mm -hmm. that one day all of us will have that mindset and we will be freed from. The, our colonial past, you know? Mm -hmm. that, that, that is what it means to me. And that's why I'm, I'm going to speak from St. Martin's perspective, of course. 
Um, that's why I think it's kind of sad that there is such a division between the islands and that in St. Martin, Tula is not, is not something we know. We know one Tete Loke, <laughs> but she's also, she was with a slave that they cut off one of her breasts when she tried to escape. But yeah, like the islands don't know each other's histories. So that is also something very important. That's something we need to sense. We need to stand still, right? Because it's, it's all connected somehow, mm -hmm. but we don't know. And that lack of knowledge is keeping us back from being a collective and being brave. Yeah. Uh, just for the people that don't know, Tula was the leader of one of the revolutions in, can I say revolutions? Uh, also called yes. rebellion uh, in the Caribbean uh, during slavery. Um, yeah, Ruben, uh, Tula. What does he mean to you? Tula. Um, I've been heard. I've been hearing of Tula when I was, I believe, in the sixth grade, and um, there was a, a, a one of a story in a Sonic Netherlands, I believe, and uh, there they were speaking about this uh, Negro um, slave leader who did bad things, bad things because he make he he heeft het in zijn hoofd gehaald om in opstand te komen tegen de blanken. Dus dat mocht niet natuurlijk. En zeker niet van de kerk. Oké, okay, dus as you grew up you you understood what this man did. It was not just um, doing bad things to, to white people. No, it was uh, trying to do the best thing, the good things for his people. And in that perspective, uh, Tula for sure is a hero. And um, yeah, for sure is a hero. And we, we could say Tula is from Curacao. I am glad that on this table from St. Martin, from Bonaire, from Aruba, we all know Tula. Mm -hmm. And that's something, that's a good starting point. And we should know uh, one uh, kick, uh, one, one tete loke. <laughs> we should know, um, what did you know, the one, uh, the mentor? Virginia. Virginia. Virginia, the mentor. We should know. We don't have any <laughs> figures yet. There, mu there must <laughs> I be. The, yes. I forgot Not the name. Yet. I forgot um, the name. Uh, Van Yanga. Yanga was, is Yeah, the, something uh, Ventura. It was something, something yeah, Ventura. Yeah, it was one yeah. that was mentioned. Yanga. So we should know all these heroes and we should celebrate them and see them as, um, as uh, examples for us today. To continue on that, let me first go to uh, Guillaume before I go back to you, Kiel. Uh, Virginia, we hear uh, a lot of times when we talk about uh, slavery and the abolition, we hear a lot of male perspectives, so I'm happy that we now heard the name Virginia. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about Virginia? Yes, um, I think um, in colonial structures, um, there is also that part of patriarchy where the man or the man's perspective always gets put in front. So I was very much more interested as an historian, but also knowing myself uh, when I was reading about Virginia. And like I said before, the um, the uh, aanwezigheid, presence. Uh, the presence of um, black enslaved people in Aruba was not documented a lot, not in uh, colonial archives, not in um, travel histories that were written personally, but the things that are known is that um, in one of the the stories there was this woman named Virginia, and she um, she kind of revolted individually against the the white oppressor that was holding her uh, hostage in the form of labor, and. Um, she kept being very defiant in every manier, in everyday ways. She would not cook, she would not do this, she would run away, she would do what she would want to do. And at a certain point, which also made clear the colonial um, um, system, because it's not just a personal thing that is historically felt maybe in our embodiment or in our family histories, but it's a system that kept all of these um, ways of labor intact. And because she didn't do what her oppressor wanted her to do, she was sent off to Curacao as a way of punishment. And I think that's very 
um, important if we commemorate the, uh, the so-called freedom. Um, we have to commemorate all of the labor, ideas of labor that are connected to these colonial structures and colonial um, ways of working because maybe we'll get to that later, but when 1863, um, the emancipation law became a thing, became uh, by law legitimate, they still, uh, the, the former enslaved black people on the different islands had to, against their will, sign a contract to keep working for 10 years. So what does that say about freedom and what does that say not only about this abstract notion of freedom, but what does it say about law and needing to sign things to kind of give your body a way to keep yourself alive, to feed yourself, you know? And so for me, Virginia is a symbol of kind of more that feminine defiance, not per se a woman's defi uh, defiance, but like, a feminine energy of defiance of like, I'll do what I want in small ways and I'll, yeah, until I get what I want. And that's what I see in her story, but sadly enough, she was obviously not um, strong enough against the colonial system and she was sent to Curacao yeah. and there's not much known about her. Afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, we'll get to that question later, I think. What does freedom mean? Because I heard the word freedom several times uh, at this table also before we started. Uh, but Kjell, uh, first of all, uh, your perspective on Tula. What does he mean to you? Um, yeah, I think for me, because I, I, I lived here first, then I moved to Bonaire. So for me, I've been back and forth a bit. I. I can't recall where I actually heard about Tula for the first time. I think it was elementary school at some point. And indeed, it's similar to what Ruben said. It's a, you know, he's a symbol of, of revolution, a symbol of um, you know, not, not obeying the, the wishes of the master, but standing up for your own people and fighting for your own right. So that's kind of um, you know, as much as I, as I see it for me personally. Um, I think that indeed collectively maybe we should center around him more as like an historical point and a person of historical importance in that sense mm -hmm. um, because this can also be of course f from my lack of experience but I, I've indeed only heard him mentioned here and there like Tula of course stood up for us and, and, and everything like that but not a, a proper commemoration as a celebration, a dedication or anything to a figure like that where we can stand still and, and really reflect on why he did what he, what he did and why it was necessary. Mm -hmm. um, from my uh, perspective, from my experience, it's only this story that I've heard of, oh, this, this guy from Curacao which stood up for, for, for the people. Can I mention something? Of course. Because <laughs> now that we're having this conversation, I, I also think about the fact that oftentimes when we're trying to recollect memories or recollect stories, historical stories that are also ours, but we don't know the language or we don't know where to look. We often get stuck, I find, in this idea of having like one big person like Tula, and he's important, but it's very important to stretch, because that's also a colonial tactic, I would say. It's important to stretch that perspective and have all of the different stories of the different islands, not only the former Dutch colonies, but like the different islands of the people who stood up in there, you know? Uh, so also in the way we talk, I find it important to stretch that narrative so that we don't just talk about one person that, you know, is the only example, but he, he was a big example, but it's important to a breader conversation over to have. I, I agree with that, but since this is like, from you know, again, mm -hmm. what, what I've seen, the one point where we have that we can talk about it, we should start using it mm -hmm. for it and then extend the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's very important to explain everything in the whole context and, and, and you know, every perspective that you can get. But sadly, because of colonialism mm -hmm. as well, we don't have a lot of those perspectives. Mm -hmm. So I think that at least for us on Bonaire, one start would be to take the one perspective that we do kind of have, because again, it's not a complete story that we have about Tula but at least start there and build from there because uh, yeah, we, we, need to, we need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's also why I consciously said symbol 
So that yeah. I think that when you're talking about a symbol, you can imagine that other perspectives mm -hmm. are included in that. Uh, could you agree with that, or is that still not? Yeah, it's not about me being right. It's just about me adding a perspective mm -hmm. to the on the table because what I often see in public spaces that aren't generally only for people in diasporas, but public spaces, mm -hmm. is that we're still searching to have broader conversations about this, and then we get sort of stuck in that one narrative, which is a very important narrative. So it's not about that binary of being right or wrong, it's more about, yes, indeed, we need a starting yeah. point, and it's important to address that. So that's why I mentioned it, yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, so just to come back to the historical impact of slavery uh, on the islands, killed, is there something you would like to say about this? Um, as in how they are still affected? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, well, one thing that I, I think from, from what I've uh, studied myself and dived into is that when you look at the structure of governing now, mm -hmm. it's not that different from the structure of governing of when you could kind of hardcore say there were colonies. Um, a lot of it is, is still the same. Um, the only difference is, is that you kind of have this at least for Bonaire, speaking for Bonaire now. Um, this like puppet government, let's use that for lack of a better term, um, that, that gets to execute the decisions that are being made, but they don't get to partake fully in the decisions that are being made. It's more that those are done here in The Hague by whichever Jan, Peter, or class that's sitting there in The Hague, and then that uh, Islands can only uh, implement them without having too much of a say of, but wait, we don't want this. Um, and yeah. Could you maybe briefly explain what the position is of Bonaire currently within the kingdom? I know it's a complicated one. Yeah. But um, maybe you can. <laughs> so, for those uh, who don't, yeah, uh, I can totally explain no. it. Unlike the other three islands that we have at the table, which are Aruba, St. Martin, and uh, Curacao. Bonaire, together with St. Eustatia and Seba, um, they're now uh, public entities, as that's called on paper, which, um, you know, I think translates to property of the state. It comes down to the same thing. And yeah, when you word it like that, you can see more uh, the whole colonial aspect of it all, being property and all that. Um, we pretty much everything we have gets decided here, um, unlike the other islands as well, which have a lot of their immigrations and, and also some of the financial things that get handled by institutions from the island. We have RCN, which is Rijks Caribis Nederland, which is pretty much the, the, the um, structural organ that determines everything and decides everything to pretty much for all the policies that we have on the island. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So you see no real dif yeah, difference. Yeah, I see no from difference. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, it's and our current uh, yeah. situation. Yeah, and next to that also, which is a point we brought up uh, before we started this discussion, that we, for the fact that our decisions are being, the decisions for the islands are being made in The Hague, we don't have any representation in that, um, which is very undemocratic, mm -hmm. because if you believe in democracy, everybody gets a fair part, but if yeah. there is a whole uh, part of the population which doesn't get to partake in the decision-making process, then that's just highly undemocratic. And again, we yeah, back to colonialism. Lawyers say there's a democratic deficit. It's, yeah. uh, it's uh, a very nice way of say saying that you're not democratically represented. Yeah. Um, Ruben, uh, the historical impacts on the islands, maybe something else uh, f apart from uh, governance. Is there something you would want to highlight? Uh, yes, um, we see, if we look at the islands, <clears throat> we see that there is um, a white elite, elite. Mm -hmm. and a black uh, underclass. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I mean uh, there is no, no better way to see this. Even a, a, a blind person could see that there is a discrepancy between uh, white and, uh, and black on the islands, not only in Curacao, but on all the other islands. 
So um, that's one example. I believe um, that the way we deal with each other, I mean, um, color is quite important. The lighter you are, that's the derecha color, zeggen wij op aan Curaçao, derecha color in papiamento. Dus make your color better. Yeah. Dus you should um, improving improve uh, your yeah. color. You should yeah. look for a, a, a lighter partner, so your children would be lighter, and so this, so they would climb on the on the ladder, on the uh, social ladder. That's a, a result of the of slavery. Um, no, so we can go on. Yeah, I mean there uh, are clearly uh, what what we call a door working. Yeah. The impact of slavery. Uh, Chantal, I know that colorism is something that you studied. Um, is there something you would like to add uh, about colorism and the relation to slavery um, on the island? Specifically on St. Martin? If that's uh, what you know best, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, St. Martin got a very, very big... Yeah. Um, flow of inflow of um, immigrants and mostly black immigrants so the ratio of black and white is yeah mostly black and um, through the years I've seen them become more pro-black and um, with what does that mean more pro-black as in they embrace their skin color like mm -hmm. I am black I am who I am because and, and the, the, the white population on St. Martin just has less of a say. And I think it also has to do with th these immigrants coming from countries outside of colonies of, of the Netherlands. And they have a different history. They have a different perspective. I can't really speak on what perspectives they have. But they obviously influence us because we're proud to be black. And I'm not going to say it, everyone is proud, but the majority, if I have to compare with the other mm -hmm. islands, they are proud to be black. So that is a, a very yeah. important thing. And I think representation we, are, representation, we also are influenced heavily by the Americans. Mm -hmm. And I think seeing them stand up for their rights also influenced us. We are much less influenced by the Dutch population, which also contributed to our proudness. All right. Uh, Kjeld, uh, blackness on Bonaire, what are your ideas about that? Um, I would agree with, with Ruben that you can clearly see a divide between like elitist white passing or white people and uh, black people who have a bit more of a subservient role. Um, I think it's 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 a bit two-sided. Like definitely with the younger generations, indeed, following movements around the world, following movements around the U.S., we've come to reclaim it more and be more proud and accepting of it, and and you know, living our life that way. But from my own experience, when I was growing up, I've noticed I need a lot of colorism towards, um, yeah anyone who's just even a bit darker than you, even if it's your family. I, I recall this cousin of mine, she was very dark skinned and she would get handed a lot of, uh, yeah, just a lot of bullying, a lot of remarks about, oh, you're black like this or blacker than that and all of it. And I feel like that's something that still is deeply rooted, but slowly, slowly we're, we're making progress towards it. Definitely with the newer, like anyone pretty much my age or younger, like 25 and under, we're more conscious of that and trying to work actively on, on making it better as well. That's hopeful, I think. Yeah. Uh, talking about progress, um, when we're talking about reparations, uh, what are your thoughts about that? I think um, many of us would maybe uh, instantly think about financial rep reparations, but maybe you have other ideas of s or similar. Um, Chantal. Yeah, I think before we can even start talking about reparations, we need to inform the, the people of the islands of where they come from mm -hmm. and why they would need to be compensated for what happened mm -hmm. because they have no idea. 
So we need to start there. We need to start building that knowledge. We need to start bringing back who we are, our culture, our history. We need to start embracing that before we can even start talking about reparation, before we can even demand something from the Dutch. So. Iona, I, I hear you saying yes. <laughs> yeah, I think um, thinking about these processes and also in the, actually to go a bit back to your previous question to the other people at the table is that what I see and also thinking about reparations and growing up in Aruba that I find is a very, there's a very big uh, appearance of anti-black sentiments in different ways because of the specific history of Aruba and uh, enslaved black people that were a very much smaller group on the island. So the the, how do you say that, the presence, I keep forgetting that word, mm -hmm. <laughs> the presence of black bodies um, is much more marginalized. It's in the margins, even though uh, black people from all over the Caribbean, especially after the Lago, um, are a very big part in um, the, 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 that keeps Aruba going up until this day. So I agree what Chantal is saying, is that also looking at Aruba and even looking at the fact that commemorating the emancipation is linked as well there to Suriname where a, a big group of black people commemorate that history and that it's not at all linked to the island also tells me that um, in the collective memory of Aruba it is at, not at all connected to um, maybe even needing specific reparations from that history if I could frame it like that because I don't know if people or I think people are not aware at all of that history um, as something from Aruba because growing up as well, um, I am almost 30, so maybe, and hopefully that changed, is that um, when we were um, when we were talking about history and in history books, my teachers had to write out oftentimes their own lessons that were uh, that were focused on enslavement, but it was almost never about Aruba. So it was always like Tula, so that's where I learned by Tula. It, uh, people went, uh, the black enslaved people were sent to Hispaniola, now Santo Domingo, or um, the in, uh, indigenous people came from Venezuela. So it was never about Aruba and that past, even though we were part of that past. So reparations, I, I feel like I'm pointing at you because I feel like there's so much work to be done in a kind of activating the collective memory of this shared past on the islands themselves as something that connects us and also the differences on the islands because even though it's a shared past, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. That collective memory is present though. I, am, I mean, we have four speakers who can speak about this subject. Uh, 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 where did you... Um, tap into that collective memory. As in a place, or what do you mean specifically? It can be a place, or a book, or a person, or like I'm not sure. Or were we, it would At this moment, you're quite informed about the slave, past of slavery and uh, the role it has on society. Uh, so obviously, mm. that knowledge is there. Um, but to what extent and maybe where? I, I, uh, so if I'm allowed to answer, at least for my case, um, it's more of like a case study situation where through learning other examples of other places who have been through the same, where it is more documented, where there has been certain different movements, it's by going through that and then looking at our case that I'm like, hey, wait, wait, no. This is not correct. There's a word, you know. So for me, I think, for me personally, that's where that knowledge comes from. Because uh, certainly on Bonaire, I haven't read up on this, and here also that information is actually not that available. Um, I, yeah, for me, that's that's how I come to learn that. Okay, Ruben. Um, reading by reading, and by listening to other people know know better. But um, I, on the theme of, of um, reparation, I mean, a lot of good things have been set on, ta on the table. Um, it starts with our ourselves. Before we look at uh, Holland, it starts with ourselves. 
It starts with the fact that we realize that we have an own, our own history, and that history has value, and that we um, should do everything possible to, to know more of that, more of that, that history. Uh, it starts with the fact that we understand that we are together, that it isn't only Curacao and only Aruba. No, we are together, and that we form a collective, and that we have to learn about others, others um, the history of the, of the other islands. We have to do that. I mean, on Curacao, how many people would know about Juana Tete Loque, or about uh, Virginia. Virginia de Menter, or Martes de Catalina Yanga. How many people know about them? But I, I, I do want to say it is important, and I very much believe in reparations from the state, because reparations and healing in a capitalist context is also economical. So I, the fact that we can think about this right now at this table is because all of us here have an economic safety net so that we have the space to be able to commemorate this. A lot of people on the islands, I go back and forth a lot, I kind of live in between, um, speaking from Aruba, they don't have headspace to think about tomorrow because they're trying to survive. So I think it's also very important next to the fact that it is a responsibility to share the knowledge that is there or that is repressed. It's also very important to remember that we come from a privileged position at this table, class-wise, in that we have the space to think about this and heal and get to the healing for ourselves. Yes, uh, I, I, I agree with that. Um, the point is we have to start with ourselves and we have to determine what should be our goals. What are the things we should be uh, needed to be done? And then we should go to the government and say, and hey, this is our, our program. We want you to finance that program. In the idea that when that program is finished, we are up to there. Driven, I hear you say we, and, and also Giona, I hear you making a distinction between the diaspora and people living on, on the islands. Um, what about that distinction? Is there, is there a danger in sitting here and talking about a them that is yes. also a us? Um, yes. I want to give the word first to Chantal, who's uh, <laughs> yeah. singing, agreeing. There is a very, very, very strong divide between the islands. And between the SSS islands and the ABC islands, it's even bigger. And we know nothing about them, they know nothing about us. We don't deal with them because, and I'm, when I say them, I'm gonna talk about Curacao right now. They, they treated us bad, mm -hmm. um, they stole our money, they took all the power, they were bad. Like, there's such a strong Rhetoric, divide. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of turned into trauma. It just increased the trauma that we've been through. And because of that, we, there's no, yeah, there is no Samu working. There is no even acknowledgement of each other, rarely. They were like, I don't want to deal with you at and all. It's also important to know that uh, Curacao politically was put in a position of overseeing the other islands by the Dutch government. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that's why it's not grounded, but I think a lot of people don't know that. Like, also the, the narrative of Antillian or coming... People always ask me if I'm from Curacao. If like, I'm from, oh, I'm from the Caribbean. And they say, oh, Curacao. That's their first idea of when they think of Dutch Caribbean, so-called. Um, and not that I'm super pro, like I need to be known as a Reuben, but there are, the, it's the ABC SSS islands. There are more islands. They all have their own histories within that collective history. So I think that's also important just to mention that it's, it comes from a political standpoint that was put in by the Dutch um, in the past to have that power over the other yeah. islands. Kiel, do you, you yeah. wanted to react? Um, yeah, kind of responding to what Chantel said. Um, though I agree that when you look from the islands itself, there, there, there's a narrative indeed of, oh, they screwed us over in the past, they did this and whoever did that. I, I'm noticing that here we find actually connection in that, um, we had a conversation about that earlier, about the Antillianness. 
Um, although, yeah, and I, 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 I guess because we look for something here that gives us a similar similarity so we can group together and band, band together and we have a similar understanding, similar language. So there's definitely some, some motivations why here that actually is something that ties us together. But, but yeah, I, I definitely do agree that on, on the other side, it isn't the same way. And I'm now, since today, I've been thinking, how do we bridge that gap? How do we make... And, but it's also important, I think that's what your question was uh, based upon, the distinction between people on the islands and the diaspora. Yeah. Because, well, like I already mentioned, the fact that we can sit here and talk about this means that we have a privilege of some sort that people back home often don't have that much. Like, these things happen there, but on way smaller scale, or people don't understand or don't have the time or headspace to think about these things because it's more of an economical issue that people are surviving. So I also feel like that's kind of what you meant as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Can I, can also, I add something? Yeah. Um, I think for the case of St. Martin, um, the, because there's so many immigrants mm -hmm. and there's more immigrants than actual St. Martiner, because what is a real St. Martiner? Yeah. It is very hard for them to relate yeah. to this history and to even acknowledge it. And that also plays a role besides the political and besides the economical. It's just the fact that the, the people of St. Martin, yeah, who are they? Where do they come from? Yeah. Following up on that, what would we then need to form a collective? I hear that we, in some kind of way, uh, need to find a collective to uh, be more informed about the past of slavery and the impact of slavery uh, on the islands. What would we need? Killed. Do you have a reaction? It's a difficult <laughs> <the> question. <laughs> oh, okay, um, let's uh, save the world. Um, <laughs> What, what, what would work? What would work? Uh, right now, just spitballing, just uh, out of my head. Something like you need an organization that would go past all the islands when it comes to education, teaching about the, the, the history, about the connectedness and all that. Just a random idea. Something like that could, could potentially work on the island side. Um, here, we, we have more platforms, I think, already to, to bridge that. Also, through studying, a lot of us run into each other and create different networks and different things. Um, so, so on. I feel like it will be a bit easier over here, but for there, for on the island, something like that. Just, they haven't thought it out, like 10 All second right. idea. That's a good first but, reaction, yeah. Riven. No, the fact that we, that we sit here from different islands and we talk together and we we learn from each other and we see things uh, maybe a, a different way, a better way, because we talk to each other, um, is a step forward. And let's say uh, over 20 years that these youngers, youngsters would go to the islands and they know of, about each other, they, they would contact each other to keep talking from the islands to the other islands. So I think Let's start here. It's, it's a natural process, I believe, in, indeed, you, you explain that, that being in, in, uh, out of, of, your, of your place, being in a different country, you try, you, you automatically go to find each other because we have a common history, and that's because we all have been colonized by Holland. We, we, we formed the Dutch Antilles, Oid. Yeah. of Dock States. So the fact that we, that we can meet each other here in Holland is a step forward. And let's hope that these connections will, will, will persist uh, over 20 years. Mm -hmm. I do, yeah. But isn't it important, because I, I focus a lot in my work in as much as possible, also, like what does pers uh, um, preserving this knowledge mean? that it doesn't just stay mobile everywhere and in informal ways that we have at home or with our families, and it's all important, but I think the difference is you, you don't per se want it to be institutionalized with rigid borders, this, how do you say, this knowledge, but it does in one way have to become sustainable that when we're not here anymore, the ones before us can, I'm grab a form of a medium, it can be a movie or it can be whatever, and that it's tangible as well in that. Because I think 
the power of where we come from and on the islands, it's not that we're not resilient and not good at preserving um, stories and uh, remembering things, I find. It's that because of all of the other factors that we have to deal with uh, in diaspora and on the islands, um, is that at one, like, op a gegeven moment it just gets kind of, it disappears with the people who die out. So we have to find ways of, and on one hand, we have this collective need to preserve it. And on the other hand, I think we also should talk about infrastructures of our own and what does that mean? And not that it stays in this informal only conversation, which is for me just a start. Chantal, do you want to react? And then I'll open up yeah. to uh, the I audience. I want to just answer your question, actually. Yes. So what do you say, what do we need? I think we need healing. That's what we need. And what does that mean to you? Healing means understanding where we come from and understanding why we are the way we are, understanding all the infrastructures that are placed there to keep us where we are, the infrastructures that are placed there to divide us. We need to understand that and we need to heal from that. And because that trauma that we have and that anger that we have towards each other is literally our barrier. It's literally stopping us from doing any and everything. So that's what you meant when you said freedom from colonial past? Yeah, one of them. One of the things that I meant, yeah. But it, the list goes on and on and on. I think we can speak from today until tomorrow, but yeah, we can speak for a very long time, but what are we actually doing? Thank you for adding that. Riven, you really wanted to react, I saw. <laughs> no, 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 I, oh, okay. I want to participate. Um, there is hope. Why do I say this? this? because the six islands have been talking to each other um, since um, July um, uh, last year. No, August last year. They have been talking to each other in the, in the, in the sense that we are talking about how can we, uh, uh, what to do to get a good picture of the impact of slavery and what should we do to alleviate that. Mm -hmm. So there are talks between the islands. Good. Very Thank good. you for adding that. <laughs> I want to open up the floor to the audience. Are there questions from the audience to the speakers? I'll look around. Yes. Uh, just one second, and the mic will go to you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, should I say it in English or in Dutch? Whatever you prefer. Um, Arubaan hier. Um, ik vind het, wat jullie doen vind ik heel erg tof. Hold up. Ja, um, yeah, what you do is everything that I hoped for 38 years ago before I was born. But Aruba is still today the, the teaching, the history that we see, that we read about, is all about Holland. We don't talk about black empowerment, no nothing, no slavery. The, all the books that we read on Aruba is all written all, uh, um, by white people. But not a set, uh, fuck, ik zeg het gewoon in het Nederlands. Yes, please gewoon, do. Yeah. Yeah. Ik heb daar op Aruba jarenlang heb ik gezeten. En ik heb daar uh, genoten. Maar wat wij op Aruba leren is precies hetzelfde wat ik leer aan mijn leerlingen hier in Nederland over Nederland. Yeah. Dus wij leren niks over de Antillen. We leren niks over Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao of de drie essen. Niks. En dat vind ik kwalijk. We zijn nu bezig op Aruba, zijn we 2024, 2025, gaan we beginnen met eigen uh, um, geschiedenisboeken. En da dat is de eerste stap naar uh, empowerment. Uh, de, uh, de, zeg, uh, dat onze kettingen uh, loslaten. En het is eigenlijk geen vraag naar jullie toe, maar ik wil wel gewoon aangeven van... Hey, als jij uh, je kind, als je naar Aruba gaat en je gaat emigreren, je kind leert precies hetzelfde wat ze hier in Nederland uh, lezen, in Apeldoorn, in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam. Precies lezen ze dat ook op Aruba. En dat is kwalijk. Uh, en er is dus nu een project om in Aruba andere boeken te maken, is dat wat ik begreep? Ja, maar daar zijn ze al twintig jaar mee bezig. Ah, okay. maar Nederland laat het niet toe. Uh, 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 ik zal eens even hier. 30 jaar. Uh, een momentje hoor, want als er niet in de microfoon wordt gesproken, dan horen de mensen thuis niet wat er gezegd wordt. Ik zie dat een dame daar uh, graag wil reageren. Uh, als je een vraag hebt aan de sprekers, ook graag, want ik wil het 
gesprek ook naar de vragers terugtrekken okay. en naar de sprekers. I will form this into a question. I'm also a fellow Rubian and I agree with you. I think it's also something with that has to do with uh, education. So the education yep. system in Aruba or on the other islands, I don't know for sure, is a Dutch system. So the books that they get in school is, comes from Holland. They teach, they teach the children, for example, uh, mathematics, everything in Dutch. So, but that's not the first language of the kids. So they begin with, an, um, how do you say, a deficit? A stop, okay. uh, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's one thing, and then the other thing, uh, so that's a question like, uh, is there something that we can change? Like, or is it already changed in the other, other islands? And then the other thing is that um, a reason why I think we don't have connection that much with the islands when we're living on the islands is uh, the geographical thing, the Caribbean Sea between us, and that it's maybe even cheaper to fly to the Netherlands yes. than it is to fly exactly. in the islands in between. So I have family living on all the islands, but I cannot see them because, I mean, cannot see them because I don't have the money and I had the money to go to study in the Netherlands where I see all the people from all the Caribbean islands who live maybe in the same city. So I think that's also your perspective I would like to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah. So the first question is uh, if there's something we can change in education. Uh, okay. Um, who wants to react first? I mean, mm, I think if we then go one step further, uh, one step below, then the issue is that we have the Dutch education system as a whole. Yes. So we need to actually abolish that on the islands and then we can take control of what we educate people in. But how are we going to get away from mommy and daddy that is selling Exactly. Us uh, it's a bigger system. We need Because yeah. if you are not connected, I literally, I, I, Ava and I, my co-host, we talk about that on the podcast. We were literally raised with the Dutch system, uh, education system, and I was always told, oh, you can... You can good learn, so you go to VWO and then you go to the Netherlands. So the I even in the podcast we call it grooming in the mm -hmm. sense of you get taught that that's the system you need to learn, that's the lessons you need to learn, and it's all Dutch because if you don't, you don't have access to social mobility in that sense to go further and study here. So that's the way of thinking. I I totally agree with that. We've all been to, to the same. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to that just by, uh, by definition of by the fact that yeah. the education system is in Dutch and everybody is pointing for an upward mobility. I, I recognize that. But there, there are fair alternatives mm -hmm. in the region. It's just that we never are offered those alternatives. Like the, shown. you have the University of the West Indies, yes. which is a, a pretty good institute. But yes. we, of course, we don't have the whole infrastructure of having the same diploma and then pretty much um, automatically being able to study yeah. there as we do here. So um, yeah, lo logistically there are definitely some differences, but there are alternatives. And now on Bonaire, I know there's more people that have been going to the US, for example, just saying, you know, screw all this, screw everything that they've been growing And that's before. mostly if you have the money. But that's a money thing. US is definitely a money thing. You really and need also money maybe for it. we can mention the University of Curacao, yeah. University of Saint Martin, and Aruba. Yeah. University of Aruba. A, yeah, the, which shows yeah. to the problem that I didn't mention them. Like exactly. we've, we've never exactly. they, the Curacao fair gets mentioned sometimes. So my brother also went there, but but it's also we're talking about higher education, and I think the question also is a question about how do we begin from the beginning. And like I said, my teachers literally hand wrote lessons about uh, the colonial past of Aruba. And I guess maybe that was something my teachers did on that school. So that's also again that informality that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. The people who find it important or have the time to add that, but it's not structurally something that gets added from the system or from, you know, like how the systematics go from day to day. Um, and there have been people fighting for that because I remember when I went to the secondary school, I had teachers at Colegio Urbano who fought for Papiamento to be a, a, a subject, uh, to get merits for that. And if you didn't have enough merit that you wouldn't pass, that that would become as important as learning Dutch or Spans or whatever. Um, be part of the state exams? Or, uh, at a point, but they never okay. got that. I don't know what the situation is now, but right. there are people fighting for that. So it's not that it doesn't happen. Chantal, I saw that you yeah. wanted to react as well on the question of education. Yeah, I think that they are trying to get them, but we have the issue of um, erkenning. Recognition. Yeah, recognition. Like, we can have a diploma and everything, but as soon as you reach somewhere else in the world, 
they're like, you're not qualified. We don't know where your diploma comes from. Mm -hmm. And that's also a link to that little red square thing, well, feet thing, <laughs> yeah, called a passport <laughs> that we use that is, that is, we need, we're, we're so dependent on it. It's a privilege. Yeah, we're so dependent on it. And like, if we decide, okay, we're going to let go of our colonial past, we also need to let go of that little thing. And how are we gonna survive then? I think that's, th that's what's holding us back, that those questions is what is holding us back. It's not that we're, we're not trying, but. Exactly. That's a yeah. big point. Uh, before we start that whole conversation, <laughs> I saw that someone in the audience also wanted may, to may, ask may. a question. May I answer um, it, a comment? Let me just, uh, oh, okay, Riven. Um, the comment of the gentleman, I will say it in Dutch because he spoke in Dutch. Ik denk dat geld een probleem is. Geld is een probleem. Ik weet nog, ik heb ze net verteld, uh, 30 jaar geleden uh, gaf ik ook geschiedenis op de Mavenschool, op een Mavenschool op uh, Curaçao. En toen waren we begonnen met het schrijven van eigen methodes, eigen stencils eigenlijk. Stencils. En, uh, maar we kwamen niet verder dan Curaçao. Dus eigenlijk hadden we geen, 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 geen zicht op Aruba en Bonaire en Sabes in de stad Sint Maarten. Het ging om Curaçao. Tegengesteld dus aan Nederland. Dus wat willen wij eigenlijk doen? Wij willen met, een, met eigen onderwijs komen. En eigen onderwijs betekent niet Nederlands onderwijs. Maar dat betekende niet Nederlands Antilliaans onderwijs. Oké, okay, dus geld is een probleem. Uh, en ik denk dat juist dit punt een van de dingen is die aan bekostigd zou moeten kunnen worden met reparations. Mm -hmm. Een van de dingen die ze, maar dat betekent wel dat wij eerst ook moeten nadenken over van willen we dit en hoe gaan we dit doen en dan zeggen van bekostig dit. Reparations via onderwijs dus uh, um, bekostigen. Ja, ja, ja. 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 Uh, mevrouw daar in het publiek had een vraag en als nog één andere persoon een vraag heeft, dan geef ik daar ook nog ruimte aan en dan gaan we daarna uh, verder naar de roundtables. Uh, mevrouw. Ja, um, ik ben eens, dat is wat meneer net zei. Ik denk we moeten ook heel specifiek zijn van wat precies wordt de reparation, dus waarvoor. Want we weten ook op de eilanden, uh, het beheren van geld is ook, niet, is ook een issue. Um, dus het moet echt specifiek zijn voor bepaalde vakken, voor bepaalde programma's uh, wordt uh, be dingen bekostigd. Um, ik wou eigenlijk uh, vragen van, um, of het is gewoon een idee, want... Um, we hebben het probleem met erkenning, inderdaad, van, van, van studies. Um, als we daar niet kunnen, uh, of ja, kunnen beginnen, want het is wel best groot en ook veel, erg lastig, denk ik, um, om het hele systeem te veranderen. Maar misschien kunnen we wel vanaf um, basisschool en ook middelbare school beginnen met uh, geschiedenisvak. Want in principe heb je geen... Uh, Um, Nederlandse geschiedenisvak nodig om bijvoorbeeld verder te studeren. Um, dus misschien kunnen we aanpassingen doen echt in het uh, geschiedenisvak op de scholen. Um, want dat is bijvoorbeeld, dan ga je niet uh, met, met wiskunde bijvoorbeeld, kan wel misschien nog hetzelfde blijven en dan kunnen we misschien daarna kijken als het in Nederlands wordt uh, um, uitgelegd of in Papimento. Um, maar met bepaalde kernvakken, zeg maar, kunnen die gewoon. Um, denk ik, voor nu behoud worden. Alleen kunnen we ergens beginnen. En ik vind, volgens mij heeft ook de meneer van Bonaire gezegd... we moeten ergens beginnen. We kunnen niet echt van alles denken. Dus misschien het eerste beginpunt is gewoon... geschiedenisvak aanpakken op de eilanden. En heb je ook een vraag? Over... Dat is wat jullie, <laughs> wat jullie ervan denken. Van, is het wel een idee om dan te beginnen op de... Uh, dus het, het geschiedenisvak daar uh, aan te pakken. Om ja. dat, um, dan de bewustwording ook te krijgen van, uh, yeah, van onze geschiedenis. Van Thank you. Uh, so, uh, the lady was saying that maybe when we uh, make changes in education, we should start with only the subject history uh, and then see from there. Uh, one last question and then we'll uh, have the speakers react. Uh, sir. Yeah, I'm directing this to the gentleman from Bonaire, um, partly because I was also born in Bonaire, but I live here now. Uh, since 2010, when Bonaire became a bijzonder gemeente, um, there's been significant change 
a lot of influx from European Dutch to the island, mm -hmm. and we're seeing you know, the, the result of that. Um, there are opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, there's a gentleman, I believe that you've done some, um, how should I call it? You were interning on yeah. the island Human Rights Watch, I believe, mm -hmm. with James Finney's. Yep. He is someone who probably, maybe in a couple of years looking back, might be someone who's like Tula, because he's standing up now for Noskir Benayrubek. I'm curious what your thoughts were with, because this is introducing a whole new perspective or a whole new complexity in what we're discussing here. Because yeah. in a couple of years, a couple of decades, the locals may be a minority. So I'm curious to see how, how do you see that developing and is there, and also, is there local support for what James is doing? How, what is the support like for that? Oh, uh, thank you for your question. We're first going to respond to the question of the lady about the education and starting at the subject history. Is, who wants to react? Me. <laughs> Giona. Well, I think it's... Okay, maybe I'm open up another can of worms, but maybe it's not just about... Because that's kind of the dynamic I was talking about is that I don't, of course we should begin somewhere, but it's also about um, if we do it from that systematic point of view that it's a VAC, like in secondary school from the Dutch system, geschiedenis is a choice, is a keuzevak. So how many people would you actually reach unless you do it in the in the basis school as well as how I got it. So that's a, a nuance in that. But what I'm also thinking is that it should not just be concentrated in one form of education or a VAC, but it should also be, for example, in Aruba, how much money gets put into marketing and how much money gets put into um, marketing. I'm specifically stating this, but also marketing of these different festivities of how Aruba is marketed as a, their history. So also changing that from a governmental point of view and where that money goes, specifically if I think of Aruba, I think that would also add to that collectiveness of remembering these types of histories and where that money goes to remember it publicly together. Mm -hmm. So it's not, for me, it's not just beginning somewhere has parallelities. It shouldn't begin just in one specific uh, form. Changing that narrative in yeah. different... Uh yeah, arenas, maybe I could say. Kjeld, your reaction on what uh, James is doing? No scared, Muneiru back. So the, one of the questions you asked specifically was whether there was support for people on the island for what he's doing. <laughs> there is support, but a lot of it is kind of under the radar. So people would be like um, private donors. They would give secret donations and stuff. Um, maybe I should explain what he's doing. Um, he, he, so, briefly, it, very briefly, he's trying to get Bonaire back on the list of non-self-governing territories, which is a list that in the past, as Curaçao and Onderhoorigheden, we were on, but then we were taken off. And what being on that list would entail is that the Dutch government holds certain responsibilities towards fostering development on the islands and also has to report to the United Nations every year. We have been kind of unrightfully taken off that list in the past. And because of that, there is no arbitration between what the Dutch state does to the islands. So that's why he's trying to get us back on that list. The thing is that a lot of people on the islands work somehow for the RCN. If the RCN finds out that you're supporting James, you will be reprimanded for it. So that's why there, there, there's quite some people that don't openly support him, but only do it secretly because their jobs might be on the line. And there it becomes economic again. Then it becomes um, economic. So I'm then, back to Guillaume. Yeah. yeah. We prefer not. Thank you for your reaction. Um, May I say something about this too? Uh, even briefly, because then we yes. can go to the round tables. Uh, the gentleman said that um, the local people are, are becoming a um, minority. They are a, a minority. 8,000 people from Bonaire against 12,000 from abroad. Are. Yeah, we, we, are, we already are, and it's already a big issue. I kind of forgot to respond to that question. 
because in uh, the, the, the projection that we have that is in, in five years from now, the voting power of the locals will be negligible. It doesn't matter anymore. So we actually are kind of in a rush to get this sorted out because in five years, technically all the, not technically, uh, in five years, all the immigrants that come from the Netherlands that of course have different ideas and are most likely more pro, pro the Dutch state, they can decide what the outcome of any election is on the island. Continuing on that, we are going to have three round tables in which uh, this subject is, one go is going to be one of them. Uh, you can see three tables over there. Uh, Kjalt is going to lead one of the discussions that is going to be about representation um, of the different islands within the state, within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, if you're interested in uh, discussing that, then you can go to that table on my right side. Uh, Guillaume is going to lead a discussion on, on um, how different communities of the diaspora can deal with the shared history of slavery. Uh, people who are interested to have that discussion can go and sit around that table in the middle. And then Ruben and Chantal are going to talk about uh, how to broaden the conversation uh, about Kirikoti from different perspectives so that it can be more diverse and inclusive. If you're interested in participating in that discussion, then please go to the table on my left side. Um, so you can stand up and go to the table you're interested in. Uh, uh, discussing, and we'll continue to uh, 2140, so 20 to 10. All right, welcome back. I heard some lively discussions. I'm very curious to know what was discussed, so I'm going to uh, straight uh, ask the speakers what were the main points you can bring to this table now, Kjeld. Uh, your table, round table, was about um, how to ensure better political representation of uh, the islands in the Netherlands and address the power balances. Yes. Well, most of, uh, most of the conversation ended up being more on how do we address this on the island in the end, but I, uh, I like right. that. I think a lot of great ideas came um, out on top. Um, one main thing that I heard that I also very agree with is that the entire political situation is extremely complex. Even for people who study it, there's so many tangents, so many uh, tutorials and belages and stuff like that. So um, having it cut out and taught clearly, also in Papiamintu, if possible, for the local people so they can understand it better and engage more. Next, that um, informing other islands, really getting the other islands that do have more um, autonomy involved in the case from Bonaire, for Bonaire, Seba and Stacia as well. Um, and yeah, so, so we can come together in support. Um, the, the one point that does relate towards here, what we can do here, is to bring all these ideas and, and talking points that we have, create petitions that we can then give to the parties that we, the political parties that we know that are more uh, friendly towards our causes, and see if um, the example that was given was that, you know, if I make a post, post something, maybe 10 people see it, while the other the other parties have bigger reaches, so if we can just bring what our statement piece forward to them and let them spread it, that already also would cause a lot more awareness here and make people more, um, yeah, make, make people here understand the situation better. Petitions sent to parties, political parties, you mean? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was the suggestion. And um, yeah, generally engage the diaspora community throughout um, yeah. about the cause. The first point actually reminded me, uh, you said that the situation is very uh, complicated also for people who are very knowledgeable about the region. Um, I somewhere read that uh, the exception is actually the normal. So there are always exceptions on the exceptions why it becomes so uh, complicated, but we see that that's the normal actually, yeah. why it can continue the way it can. Yeah, exactly. Um, Chantal and Ruben, your round table discussion was about uh, Ketikoti and how to make it more diverse and inclusive. What were your main points uh, that you got from the table? Mm, yeah, I'll, I'll start and you can just fill me in. Um, I think we started with 
um, getting our house in order. That means getting the islands knowledgeable and understanding of, of what's going on. And that's not, we don't only mean socially, but also politically. We need to get our house in order. Um, there's just way too much corruption, there's way too much freelancing going on. So there needs to be something done in, on the education part of, of things, um, on the social part of things, but also on the political part of things on our islands before we can even reach to the Netherlands. And when we do reach to the Netherlands, of course, education is, is important. And not only um, in the institutions, and so not only in schools, but things that we are doing right now, like such panel discussions, um, such events that can just bring awareness. We can just organize ourselves. The little people that, that know can make such a big impact just by sharing knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it makes people more and more curious and eventually we grow. Do you have anything to fill in? Um, I was uh, triggered by a question, I don't know the names, excuse me, but someone uh, uh, said uh, Surinamese people, they know a lot about um, July 1st and they commemorate that, they celebrate that but Antillian people do not do that. And the question is, why not? And the second question should be, um, is it necessary for the Antillian people to do that? To commemorate July 1st. And what was the answer on that question? Was there an answer? <laughs> no, we did not. Yeah, it, it was a strong discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, time constraints. But we did come to the conclusion that the name Ketikoti what does that mean for us? And shouldn't it be Emancipation Day? And isn't us calling it Kitty Koti, us hiding behind Suriname and us standing for our own rights and being who we are and claiming our identity? Is that us being scared of the Dutch? Is that us taking that, that colon, colonial um, position back? What, what does it mean? And that's a very interesting question that, you know, we need to get back on. So there's the issue of language then also. Yeah. But then what language would you then use instead of? Emancipation Day, Dia de Emancipation. Ah, OK, in Papiamento. Uh, English uh, is just not Ketikoti. That's not our language. That's not our name. OK. So then either Papiamento or English is what you were. Yeah. Uh, OK. Guillaume. Yes. Your round table about uh, different communities of the diaspora and how they can uh, deal with the shared history of slavery. Yeah, it was focused more in practice on organizing ourselves um, with the knowledge generally that we have about our past and also current knowledge that we have, which could include obviously um, the, knowledge, the colonial knowledge. And it was a very lively um, discussion because what I already thought that would be the case is that um, that's what I often see is that there is so much knowledge. So it's not that we don't have knowledge, but the, the sharing of knowledge, the taking up of knowledge from people in our group who were from an older generation who has seen and has done so many things that we don't know about what they already did from their diaspora and their position. You know, what does that say in how we do organize ourselves, but there is no um, transference of knowledge. And um, that on the one hand, we talked about the different ways of organizing ourselves, maybe digitally, which is more current day sharing of knowledge, but also kind of, there was an ongoing conversation about how um, emotion of this past and going forward to the, from the present to the future is too much intertwined oftentimes that we don't move forward um, with preserving this knowledge. So it's often a discussion like, okay, this is important and this isn't, or this part of the history should be included and, or this isn't. And we kind of stay stuck in rhetorics in, in, in what needs to be added or not because we come from histories of oral stories. So how do we, do we want to and how do we make it more, I would say in my words specifically less dynamic and more static because then maybe it's more tangible to transfer. And we also talked about like um, the economic part of it. Um, 
do we organize ourselves and get paid for that? Um, even though we had two people in our group who did so much on uh, vrijwilligerswerk, how do you say that? Um, voluntary work. Yeah, voluntary work and gained so many other things um, by that, but that uh, current day people often think more in money than in the transfer of knowledge. So that was kind of the conversation. So it was actually the, the, the to-dos or how do we organize is actually even becoming um, sign over uh, what that does that even mean to different generations, I would say. Um, how do we make ourselves more visible um, from the past going to the now and maybe going to the future? One of the things that was said is the digital world, focusing more on ourselves instead of what the Dutch is, imp are, is imposing on us. And I personally think it's a parallel thing because we need to un pack while we build. And that's the colonial aspect still of it up until this day. So in sort of short, <laughs> that's my answer or our answer. Thank you. Uh, wow, quite some feedback. Um, I want to end with uh, something that I just improvised. Ruben, uh, before we started, there was a song uh, you said we could play. Uh, can you please tell us what song that was and why you wanted us to play that song? Uh, and I will follow up with a question and then we'll end a uh, wrap up. That was uh, The Slave uh, from Mighty Sparrow. You know Mighty Sparrow, the best Calypsonian of Trinidad of the world. Um, he has a song named the, Sil the Slave and in four or five... Um, um, Verses. 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 He tells the story about black people in the Caribbean, how they were kept in Africa, brought to the Caribbean, uh, had to uh, work hard. Uh, then they thought about um, fleeing or, or, or revolting, but when they look at the white man standing there with a whip in his hand, then mm -mm, we won't do that. And then they wanted to express themselves. They couldn't do that because uh, the, the slave master wouldn't let them do that. And so Calypso, Calypso began. So they couldn't talk, and so they sang this sorrow. And um, the last uh, strophe says that then they were free. Some, um, someone shouted, uh, free the bloody slaves. And then I was on the street. I had no fault. I had no culture. I, had, I, was, I lived like a vulture. En dat zijn we vandaag. Luister een keer um, naar um, de slave, de slaaf. De the, the question is how does it start? Can we play 10 seconds of the song? Is that possible? Yeah, I think. There it goes. Thank you. So the last verse is about freedom. And since we're running up to the 1st of July in the commemoration of uh, abolition, the last question I want to ask you is what does freedom mean to you in the context of the conversation of today? <laughs> Chantal. Yeah, freedom to me means letting go of, first of all, trauma, um, and starting a healing journey. Um, also accepting where we come from, but before we can accept, we need to learn where we come from, of course. Um, and also standing up for our rights. I think rich, a very small group is trying, but we need to be together, we need to be united as a collective, collective and just stand up for our rights. And I think that's where freedom begins. Thank you. Kjeld. Um, for me, it comes down maybe a bit poignant to what I'm doing, to self-determination, also personal freedom. 
being able to fill in your own destiny, being able to make the choices you want to make and fill in, you know, color the painting of your life with the colors you want. For me, that's the best way I could, could describe freedom in a way that it is both personal and for everybody. Thank you. Riven. Difficult question. Um, freedom is in, uh, doesn't, um, is, ik zal het in het Nederlands voor. Yes, please. Vrijheid betekent in ieder geval niet, uh, um, uh, niet, niet kunnen doen wat je graag zou willen doen. Maar vrijheid betekent niet dat je altijd kunt doen, op elk moment van de dag, hm. alles wat je, kunt, wat je zou willen doen. Dat gaat ook niet, want je hebt rekening te houden met, met anderen. Dus freedom, uh, freedom in die zin is dan begrensd. Je hebt rekening te houden met de anderen. Je hebt rekening te houden met, de, met je collect, collectivity. Uh, je hebt... Uh, 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 je, je, eigenlijk ben je zelfs verplicht om samen met die collectiviteit te streven naar gezamenlijke doelen. En daar gaat het om, gezamenlijke doelen. En die gezamenlijke doelen zouden dus moeten worden vastgesteld, opgesteld, bedacht, besproken. En dan kunnen wij naar een situatie toe waarbij wij um, voor een groot deel kunnen doen wat we willen, maar niet alles. Thank you. So freedom is not having the choice to do everything you want to do at every moment you want to, but is uh, limited by the collectivity. Thank you. Guillaume. In that sense, what I hear Ruben saying is uh, freedom comes with self-responsibility and collective responsibility. And I think for me, it's a layered concept because I don't think we can talk about this abstract thing of freedom when there are many people still up at an, until this day in many parts of the world being held in like forms of concentration camps or wars or whatever. and. For me, yes, personal freedom, releasing myself from certain ways of thinking that I inherited through the shared history that we talked about today. But freedom is also me freeing myself from those binds and seeing how my responsibility I find to a collective of people in this day and age, um, until they, in that sense, are freed, then I cannot feel completely free in that, in myself either. Um, because what Ruben also said, I live in connection with others. Um, and I think that is how I think of freedom, um, to make it a more tangible for myself. Yeah. Thank you. Let en let's end with those words. I want to thank the audience and the speakers for today on behalf of uh, Be Right Back by Being, Ninse and Valkuis uh, de Zwijger. I see a hand going up. We have the chance to uh, talk among each other afterwards. Um, may I please remind you of the two events that are going to take place uh, this month as well. The 23rd of June, Swart Manifest is going to talk about turning Katikoti or turning uh, the 1st of July into a national holiday. And then there is going to be a Katikoti lecture on the 30th of this month by by Professor Dr. Rosemary Allen. And I'm very happy that she's going to speak here, so please be uh, present. Thank you, have a nice evening, and please be welcome at the bar for a drink together so we can uh, further discuss.